here a little bit. Again, Paul's on trial. He's been sitting at Caesarea Maritima there for two years. Uh, he's made his uh, appeal to Caesar as uh, Festus, the new uh, proctor, the new governor, comes in. Uh, the Jews, the Sanhedrin, uh, the religious leaders in Jerusalem still want the death of the Apostle Paul for his uh, preaching the gospel and so forth, the way he's done in establishing uh, the many churches in uh, what we'd call Western Turkey, as well as Greece and some of the er other areas there. Uh, and uh, he's been in prison there under house arrest. He, um, Festus comes in and uh, <clears throat> he's not as corrupt as Felix uh, and he's one of these guys that wants to take care of business. So within days, he's got uh, representatives of the Sanhedrin uh, and that council there in Caesarea. Uh, Paul stands before uh, a trial before him and in a sense shares uh, part of uh, his testimony there. Uh, also what happens then, the king and the queen, uh, uh, Herod, uh, Herod Agrippa II shows up uh, with his lovely wife, uh, Bernice, uh, and uh, Festus wants them to see the Apostle Paul as well because Paul's appeal to go to Caesar, uh, and he has no charges. He has, he has nothing to say uh, to uh, uh, send to uh, Caesar Nero, and since Agrippa is, an, as we'll, Paul will say, an expert on the law uh, and Jewish ritual and so forth, uh, he wants him to hear him, that he might help him come up with some kind of charges against the uh, Apostle Paul. Uh, this is going to be the longest uh, of Paul's testimonies that we have uh, in the New Testament. He'll include some details that he doesn't include uh, in other occasions. Uh, and it's uh, quite a crowd that uh, he's there before. All the leading Roman officials are there, including Festus, as well as Agrippa and Bernice. Now, we talked about uh, uh, their, their background a bit last time. And I'll, I'll just go through it real briefly and uh, just uh, in a sense to say it's very interesting as we'll read. Paul will state in his opening address how excited he is to preach the gospel to this lovely couple. Uh, it was King Agrippa I uh, who killed and persecuted Christians in the first century. He saw his father chop the head off of James uh, the apostle. He saw his father put Peter in prison. He saw his father die, in a sense, in the same spot he is now holding trial there in Caesarea, uh, when he stood before a crowd uh, in beautiful golden robes and the sun glistening off of him. They said, you're, as they chanted, your words are the words of a God. Uh, he received them. That's, uh, that's the father. And uh, uh, it's quite the family. He's about 16 years old. At 17, Claudius, who is the emperor, uh, appoints him over a, a small area of northern Galilee. Uh, he is made head over the Jew Jewish religion. He's the guy at 17 that appoints who the high priest will be uh, in Jerusalem. He's in charge of all the priestly uh, garments and so forth. He lives a completely immoral life, yet he keeps, claims to be Jewish, and keeps all the Jewish feasts, the laws, and, uh, and so forth. And in terms of his, uh, his lovely wife, well, I say that tongue in cheek, but Bernice is considered one of the most beautiful woman, uh, women in that part of the world. Apparently she knows it. She tries to use it to her uh, advantage. We've already met her wife, Drusilla, earlier. Uh, they have been uh, this brother and sister. Uh, they are brother and sister, have been uh, married. Uh, Grip is uh, about 31 years old at this point. Here's a little family chart. Of, uh, of these guys. If we go to the next slide, is it there? There we go. So you got Herod the Great uh, up there. Great only because he was a builder. Uh, brutal man. And then Herodias has Herod Agrippa I, the guy we're just talking about, who was uh, basically struck down by God. There's his four, uh, four kids there. Bernice, Agrippa, Felix, not the Felix in our story, uh, and Drusilla. So you can see that Agrippa II and Bernice are actually brother and sister. Uh, they, they were so bad that um, the pagan Romans were kind of horrified at their, uh, at their relationship. Uh, she herself, I think the first time she's married, she's like 13 years old. Uh, she uh, ends up leaving that guy. She's married several times, uh, is with her brother, living with him, uh, goes with some other guy, comes back, marries him again. Eventually, she's the, the mistress of, uh, 
uh, of one of the uh, uh, Roman emperors. She ends up having uh, uh, an affair with Titus, the guy that uh, marches into uh, uh, Jerusalem and uh, destroys the, the city in 70 AD. Uh, he, because he is Jewish but is sided with the Romans, he's very good friends with, with um, uh, Flavius Josephus, so Josephus in his uh, History of the Jewish Wars writes quite a bit and actually includes a copy of, uh, uh, of a letter sent to him by uh, this particular king. All that to say is that their lives are pretty much a soap opera and they're completely immoral. But yet, yet, when Paul has a chance to preach the gospel and share his testimony, he's excited. And, and I, I think uh, uh, what we see in it, uh, and uh, you be the judge if I'm reading this, I think he's kind of optimistic. I mean, he's not like, well, I, I, I probably should share my testimony just out of some kind of obligation. He's going for it. I, I, I think he believes these guys can get saved, that nobody's beyond, beyond the gospel. And certainly uh, that's one of the important things that we need to uh, see here. Again, Paul sitting in prison for two years uh, unjustly. And uh, uh, this will be the, the last of his trials that we have recorded here in the book of Acts. Uh, you be the judge who's really on trial here. Uh, for the first three verses, preliminary comments uh, to the king, uh, they're important because of the same, some of the things I've just mentioned. Verse 1, then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. And here it is, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews, therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. <laughs> That's a preacher's way of saying this is going to be a long sermon. Hear me patiently. <clears throat> There's a couple of things I can relate to in this message. But uh, pre preliminary comments are, are there because he is a Jewish king. He knew that he was an expert. He says that at the beginning. Therefore, he can make a better case in terms of the gospel itself, who Jesus is, his resurrection, uh, and we'll see him, uh, see him certainly do that. But uh, this is his advantage versus standing before these, uh, these Roman officials. <clears throat> we might liken it to volleyball teams coming to the Stan Sheriff Arena to play. <clears throat> Most volleyball teams, uh, even if they think they're going to get beat uh, by the Rainbow Wahine, still love to come play. Two reasons. It'll be the biggest crowd they, they will ever play before in their entire lives. They're used to playing in gyms with 500 or 1,000 people there. They go down there, and there's anywhere from six to eight or 10,000 people in the arena. It's unbelievable for them. And the other thing is that volleyball fans in Hawaii are experts. And therefore, even though they're the opponent, if they make a good play, everybody cheers. Because they, they recognize uh, talent and ability when they, when they see it. Paul's excited, even though he's the underdog here, uh, because Agrippa is an expert, and he can make his an appeal rationally, logically, uh, in using the scripture, and that's what we saw in verse two. I think I think myself happy, <laughs> King Agrippa, as he stands there uh, in his chains. Uh, they're all in their purple robes of royalty. All of the Roman officials are are decked out in their red robes, and Paul's in his little prison tunic with his <laughs> chains on. But he thinks himself happy here in these uh, preliminary comments. Paul then launches into his uh, testimony, and we talked uh, before, when we've gone through it, Paul always delivers a very clear before, how, and after. And uh, if you have a, an adult conversion testimony like Paul, it should contain those elements. And, uh, and we'll see that again here. Verse 4, my manner of life from my youth which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first. If they're willing to testify that according to the strictest set, sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes, earnestly serving God day and night, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and in many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. 
and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So here's Paul in a couple of sentences here, kind of encapsulates his life before he comes to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And he mentions uh, his life of a Pharisee. And he does this and says this because it was the strictest sect of Judaism. He does it also because there's a lot of Pharisees in this crowd. Again, probably not the entire Sanhedrin, but quite a few of them have come uh, down from Jerusalem uh, to Caesarea to, uh, to hear uh, uh, Paul's comments. Now, Paul, a few times, uh, he doesn't go into detail here uh, about his training and studying with Gamaliel and all these things because they all know it. These guys, a lot of these guys grew up with him. They know him very well. Paul wasn't like a Pharisee. He was like the man. <laughs> you know, he was, he was the, uh, the up and coming. I don't know. I want to make any uh, parallels here or whatever. But, uh, you know, it, it, but this would be like, see, if you're a Christian and you're not sure who Franklin Graham is, okay, you don't get out of much. You know, they, they knew who Paul was as, as a Pharisee. Uh, when he writes to the church in Galatia, he makes reference to his past. As a Pharisee, when he writes to the church in Philippi, he does as well. I want to read the, both of those passages just to give details that these guys would have been well aware of. Uh, to the church in Galatia, he wrote, For you have heard of my for former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. He was, he was saying that I wasn't just a Pharisee. I was pretty much, you know, I was pretty much it. I didn't just go to Puno. I, I, I went on to Harvard. And I graduated, graduated at the top of my class. And you guys all know it here. This is, in a sense, what, what he's saying here. Uh, to the church in Philippi, he said, it says nothing against Punahou or uh, either of the schools. I'm just saying he had this tremendous... Uh, in, you know, uh, education of, the, of influence. Uh, Philippians, uh, he says, uh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised of the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Sometimes we read uh, through that and don't think much of that comment. Uh, but uh, the Benjamites were highly esteemed because you remember when the kingdom divided over taxes, that's still a problem in some places, but when the kingdom divides, uh, there are 10 tribes that go to the north. There's only one tribe that remains loyal to Judah, the Benjamites. They were the loyal tribe. He was of that tribe. He was highly esteemed because of that. A Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Paul doesn't think that he never sinned, uh, but uh, in terms of the law, he perfectly kept the law. If he unknowingly committed a sin, then he made the proper sacrifice for it. But Paul was blameless. He stood with a clear conscience in terms of being a, a Pharisee. And, and uh, certainly all of the Pharisees would have backed him up on that. They knew who he was. A lot of them probably grew up with him, went to the same schools. Uh, the Sadducees certainly knew it as well, probably despised him because of his brilliance as a Pharisee and so forth. Festus, he doesn't know what's going on. He's just a Roman official wanting some help here on a Jewish matter. Agrippa might have known. Uh, Agrippa certainly knows about Jesus. He knows about his miracles. He knows about his death. He knows about his alleged resurrection. Uh, he would have heard about all of these things. He's, he's the guy over, over Judaism again. Uh, he probably knows who Paul was, what he was doing on behalf of, of Judaism, and what's happened in his life. Uh, so Paul is uh, laying out his, his testimony uh, here prior to coming to faith in Christ. He's a Pharisee. Uh, and then secondly, he mentions the idea of his, uh, even in his prior life before Christ is believing in the resurrection. They were saying, uh, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Uh, verse 8. Two things here. One is that uh, this was the hope of Israel, that we're all going to get resurrected. We're all waiting for the Messiah. So he's saying, this is what we all believe. This is what our nation is all about. So when I talk about the, the resurrection, why are you been out of shape? This is what we've all been waiting on here. The other thing he does here, it's interesting, is that uh, by you is plural. 
So Paul's not no longer just speaking to Agrippa. He's really speaking to anybody in that courtroom uh, that will listen to him uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. Uh, the critical juncture uh, a doctrine to Paul certainly is the resurrection. He's going to lay out his proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says to Agrippa, do you think this idea of the resurrection is incredible? It's almost like I, it's a rhetorical. And it's like, of course you don't. Uh, and then thirdly, about his uh, prior life, uh, the involvement in persecuting the church. The Jews knew that Paul was the persecutor uh, of the church. He uses the term here uh, in verse 10, I cast my vote against them. So Paul, in, in, which led to their death. We've read other places. We, Paul was a wild man. You know, this, the idea, that, the comment that he was uh, breathing out threats uh, in chapter 9 is a phrase that's used of, a, of an animal or a horse that's run and he's out of breath. Uh, the, the, uses, uh, the verbs that uh, Luke uses uh, indicates Paul was just, uh, he was a crazy guy. He was a crazed guy. He was so zealous for persecuting uh, Christians, torturing them, trying to get them to blaspheme men and women. Uh, and if not so, many of them uh, to the death were, were martyred. That's, that's the Apostle Paul. And he makes no bones about his prior life uh, before he came to faith uh, in, uh, in Jesus Christ. In terms of casting his vote, it's that phrase that uh, would indicate to some of us, and I'd be in that crowd, that to believe that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin itself. So his preliminary comments are important because we need to see who he is that he's trying to reach with the gospel. Uh, his prayer life, that's the first part of his testimony. And then he goes into how he came to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're seeing it's a phenomenal experience on the way to Damascus. And that's in verse 12 to 18. While thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at Midio, midday, O king. Along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goat. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith uh, in me. So it is quite a phenomenal experience. He uses the phrase here, I saw a light from heaven. One of the things that we get here that we don't have in other places is the further description in verse 13 that it's brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. <clears throat> so it's so bright, basically it knocks them all on the ground. Paul, as well as the other guys around him, Jesus appears to him, we might say, in the brightness of his glory. Sometimes you're a little confused and fuzzy on this issue of, of Jesus and who he is. Uh, and understand who he is to us uh, now that he has uh, his in incarnation. He comes and he's born uh, as a baby in the manger, as we'll look at next week. He lives that perfect, sinless life, uh, his death, his resurrection, and now in a glorified state. Uh, he's no longer that hippie guy walking around in sandals. Uh, he is our glorified, holy and righteous Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who will return and with the mouth of his breath destroy his enemies uh, on this planet. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he allowed Peter, James, and John to see a little glimpse of that. As in a sense, he pulled back the curtain of his flesh and allowed his glory to be seen. Uh, Paul makes reference to it in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. When he's talking about the Antichrist, and then when Jesus returns to planet Earth, he says there, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The writer of Hebrews compares uh, Jesus uh, to God the Father in this way, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. So when Jesus shows up, 
And uh, to Paul, uh, the light is so bright, he says, brighter than the sun. That, that's pretty bright. It's brighter than the sun. Uh, basically, uh, they're knocked on the ground. Paul the Pharisee, the self-righteous, the very self-righteous, zealous Pharisee, uh, needed to discover that his good character and his respectable, uh, uh, his, uh, respectable character and his good works would not get him to heaven. And he was very shocked, certainly, uh, to hear this voice and recognize uh, that it's Jesus. Verse 14, I heard a voice speaking to me. Now, apparently, Paul hears the words and the voice. Everyone hears sounds, but only Paul is able to discern as God uh, speaks to him here, using his name, speaking to him uh, in Hebrew. And, of course, the phenomenal experience includes two surprises. One, Jesus is alive. And the other one, that he is so united to his people uh, that when Paul persecutes them, it is though Jesus himself is being persecuted. I don't know if you, you got that. <clears throat> Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Was, was Paul literally persecuting Jesus? No, he literally wasn't. He was persecuting the people of God or G, uh, the body of Christ. Uh, but Jesus took it as though he were personally being persecuted. When ISIS moves through Syria and northern and Iraq and butchers and beheads men, women, and children right now, right now today, as those things are taking place, uh, Jesus looks down and weeps, and it's as though he is the one that is being persecuted. The things that took place in the first century uh, are growing by uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, the days that uh, we're living in today, uh, it's horrific. It's not that Jesus doesn't know, doesn't care, uh, doesn't see. Uh, he does, uh, and uh, when they are persecuted, it is though he is persecuted. And certainly the same is true of our lives here. Uh, two uh, experiences that were very much a surprise. And then it includes uh, Paul's own struggle with the truth. Verse 14, another line that is not included uh, anywhere else in his other testimonies. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. The, go the goad, uh, if you may or may not know, was basically a stick with a sharp point. And when, they, when the uh, farmer was plowing with his water buffalo or his uh, oxen, if the, uh, if the oxen decided to take a break when he wasn't supposed to, then he'd take this little sharp stick and just hit him right in the back of the hills, right on, right on the Achilles tendon. And that would make him want to keep going. <laughs> and it was very effective. Uh, and uh, Jesus says to Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? It's not just like, Paul, I'm having to poke you to keep you going a little bit. You're kicking against it. And I think it's the, obviously the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is that Paul continues to kick against. We might consider, what were those goats? Well, certainly one of, one of, one of them would have been the testimony of Stephen. Uh, Stephen, as you remember, Paul's there holding the garments. They take him outside. Uh, they're uh, stoning him, which was a brutal way to die. Uh, and as Stephen is dying... Uh, his face is like that of an angel. Uh, he is saying to those that are murdering him uh, that he forgives them. Uh, there's a, a lot of parallelism between uh, his death right then, and certainly the death of Jesus on the cross, at least in terms of the words they express and, uh, and so forth. Those words had to have rung uh, into the ears of Saul of Tarsus. Not only that, consider that countless individuals that Paul put to death or Paul tortured and heard men and women uh, refuse to recount their faith in Jesus Christ uh, and by the grace of God died as the old saints used to say with a good testimony on their lips. If you read about uh, Fox's book, book of Martyrs, some of the horrific things that Christians have gone through the years, their big prayer was not to be saved from the stake and being burned with fire. Their prayer was they would die with a good testimony on their lips. Uh, and give God the glory through their last words. Paul heard a lot of those last words. And I think it was like goads right into the Achilles tendon. He's, he's not listening. He's kicking against it. You have also then the dead works of Judaism. Uh, keep in mind, Paul was able to keep the law. Uh, Paul had the prestige of being a Pharisee and so forth. Uh, but he could go and 
offer the sacrifices to atone for, to temporarily cover his sin, but his sins could never be removed. It wasn't possible until the Messiah came and died for them. He went around and bore the brunt, as everyone else did, uh, of an empty life of a religious person with a guilty conscience and never knowing if they were truly forgiven, with never having a real peace uh, in his heart. I think these are all the goads that he's kicking against that Jesus makes reference to here. A phenomenal experience on the road to Damascus, direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Notice the promises. He promises to be with Paul, to protect Paul, and to reveal himself to Paul on other occasions, which he does. Uh, he uh, reveals himself. Uh, three, uh, th uh, again, in Damascus, uh, the Damascus Road, three years later in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we re read about when he appeared to him in Corinth. Uh, and in chapter 23, we'll read about one more occasion. Sometimes people ask us, well, you say that the Bible is inspired, the inspired word of God. How can you say that? We say because God gave it to us by direct revelation. God showed up and told Paul what to write. God showed up and told John what to write. God showed up and told Moses what to write. And they say that over and over again. Uh, and the word of the Lord to me was thus, and then they write. The Bible claims to be the, the word of God over and over again by special revelation, general revelation. We can look out and see creation. We can know certain things about God, his, his uh, incredible power, his majesty, and, uh, and so forth. But to know and understand the gospel and the character of God, it took special revelation. God chose to reveal himself to man. He certainly does this. He promises to do it here on, on other occasions with uh, Saul of Tarsus. The fourth thing here as we get to the, the other part of Paul's testimony, the after part. And again, when we're sharing our testimony sometimes, it, we, we don't want to front load it too much with what a terrible rotten sinner I was and turn it into a bragamony instead of a testimony. Yeah, man, I could drink a case of beer in a day. You know, it's like, well, awesome. Did you, God done anything in your life recently, you know? Yeah, I said that prayer. I'm, I've been a lot better. Uh, that's not exactly what we're looking for here, you know? It's, yeah, here's, here's some clear, clear things. If you have an alcohol problem, then that might be a relevant issue. But, uh, you know, uh, those things are here. And then how? How you got saved? Did you hear the, how did you hear the gospel? Was it on the radio? Was it on TV? Was it in a church? Just, just your story. How was it? Uh, and what you did, what you prayed, what God did. Uh, and then uh, hopefully you can say like Paul, look at verse 19. Uh, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And he's going to go on and say, here's how my life was different. It was, <laughs> it was really different from what it was before. Uh, this is the after part. Uh, Paul shares God's plan for his life. Verse 20. <clears throat> but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem throughout the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles uh, that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those things which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer that he would be the first to rise from the dead and bro would proclaim light to the Jewish people uh, and to the Gentiles. Paul's saying, you know, I've, uh, <clears throat> my life is very different now. Uh, God's plan for me included becoming a servant and a witness. And of course, we're hearing the witness now. He said, I, I haven't been disobedient uh, to what God called me to do. Uh, the term that he uses here for servant is interesting. It's the, it's the term literally in the Greek, under rower. It's the idea of the, the galley ship, you know, like in the Ben Hur movies and those guys are, are rowing and everything. It's the guys in the very bottom, the under, <laughs> it's not just the guys rowing, it's the guys uh, uh, down there in the bottom of the ship doing the rowing. And of course, the men like Festus, this, this must have been phenomenal. Now you've got this Roman official, very efficient in what he does and so forth. Uh, he's there in his red robes, his official, Position sitting up there on the beam of seat, looking down at the Apostle Paul. And here's a man he knows, he's heard, uh, was a, a leader among his contemporaries, a leader within uh, Judaism with this tremendous education. 
uh, this tremendous influence within the Sanhedrin and the Jewish council in Jerusalem. And in a sense, he's thrown it all away to become an under rower, to become a servant, uh, the, the bottom of the depths of servanthood of Jesus Christ. And to a man like that, no wonder he's going to call him crazy uh, before this little trial uh, is over. Uh, God's plan, Paul says, also included being sent to rescue others. Uh, and it is interesting the description that he makes uh, in terms of uh, where people are, where they need to, uh, to come to, uh, to, to leave their sin behind and to repent. And certainly, Paul had a great love for the Jewish people, but uh, he's probably a little shocked at that point that God says, and I'm going to send you to the Gentiles uh, also. But uh, uh, what he's able to do and what we do when we come to faith in Christ, we really trade our allegiance from one kingdom to the next, from one, one leader or one king uh, and to the next. Uh, and that's, in a sense, what he's describing here. Paul's going to get sent out and rescue people out of one kingdom that's falling apart, that's decaying, so forth, and bring them into the kingdom of the Son. There's a classic illustration of this in the life of David uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 22. He's on the run from Saul. Saul is the king. He's the king, anointed king of Israel. Uh, he wants to kill David because David has been anointed by Samuel to be the next king. He is the coming king. His kingdom hasn't come yet, uh, but he's been promised by God that it will come. Uh, there are men that believe what God said. And so they're going to leave one kingdom and they're going to transfer their allegiance uh, to another kingdom. Uh, it says this in uh, verse 1 of uh, 1 Samuel 22. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave at Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down to him there. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain, the ruler, over them. And there was about 400 men. And, uh, and of course, here's the description of uh, a lot of people when they come to faith in Christ. Uh, they're uh, in distress because of their, their own life. They're in debt because of their own sin, uh, a price that can never be paid. Uh, and they're uh, discontented with their life. And... Um, so that preaches, it's even already alliterated, it's three, it's three Ds. Uh, but what's happening again is that these guys are transferring an allegiance. Saul's there, he's sitting on the throne, but he's, they know he's not going to remain on that throne. He's not going to remain the ruler. They see his kingdom is corrupt and apart from God. They're going to they're gonna chat them. <laughs> they're going to change their allegiance to a guy whose kingdom has not come yet. Who is not the king yet? But God's word says he's going to be. And Paul says, that's what I do. I go out and I preach this message and I rescue people from a kingdom of darkness and I bring them into a kingdom of light from the power of Satan uh, to the power of God. It's pretty radical, isn't it? To think of your friends and family members that don't know the Lord. They are under, according to Paul, they are under the power of Satan. And it's up to us. We get to play a part. God's, God's the one that saves people. He uses us to deliver the message, uh, to use the gospel to save them from the power of Satan uh, to the power of God. It's an a allegiance that ends up being transferred to our coming king. Paul also mentions in terms of God's plan, as I mentioned, verse 19, uh, that he was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Uh, and as such, it almost cost him his life right off the bat in Damascus. You remember that uh, he had to be lowered over the wall in the basket just to, to escape. He goes to Jerusalem. Oh, gee, shucks. They tried to kill him there as well. Uh, and even uh, Peter and the boys said, you better stay out of town for a bit until things cool down. And he goes, uh, uh, goes back home again, uh, certainly involved in the ministry for a number of years before Barnabas goes and gets him and brings him up to uh, Antioch. Uh, but it didn't get any easier as he went out to preach the gospel, did it? As we've kind of followed his missionary journeys and saw how many times, well, he was left for dead uh, at one point in time. And the, uh, the torture and the brutality that Paul went through all for the gospel. But he wasn't disobedient to the call. He was faithful. Uh, he persevered. And we need to as well. If we're going to see our friends and family members say we kind of can't give up <laughs> you know sometimes you, know, you share the gospel with somebody and it's like ah they said no 
Well, yeah, you got, you got to kind of hang in there, though. You know, you know, it's just kind of the beginning. You got to be uh, a little patient. You got to, you got to uh, persevere here uh, a bit. Uh, yesterday, I had the uh, chance, of, uh, chance of going to a memorial service for uh, Kathy's uh, uh, cousin, only, uh, only 50 years old, went, went to be with the Lord uh, a month or so ago. Uh, and it's one of those occasions, of course, where you get to see a lot of extended family and... Um, Man, I saw a lot of extended family I didn't even know we had. And uh, it was, um, uh, it's a sad, mournful, but we're, we're stoked and excited to know that uh, one of her, her, her sons had come to faith in the Lord. We hadn't seen him in about 15 years. They live in Kauai and led his mom to the Lord and uh, she's with the Lord. And, but uh, to be able to kind of continue to this family that we've come to know and love and just kind of continue to be there and give the gospel and Man, what, what an opportunity. You know, do you, I don't know if you wish you had that opportunity. You wish you could line up all your family, put them under a little tent somewhere, and they're going to stand and listen to you for about 15 minutes as you clearly lay out the gospel to them, and then you're going to pray for them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, that's, I, 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 get, I, I get a little nervous. I was actually a little nervous. I could tell I was a little nervous. I just feel such a responsibility because I, I know a lot of them, they're, they're not going to hear it anywhere else. This, this, this might be it. You know, or, or maybe I'll get another, another shot. But uh, we need to be patient and persevere, uh, as Paul did. He says, I wasn't disobedient to the vision. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Uh, but Paul uh, hung in there. Uh, and then God's plan included Paul's message based on the scripture. Verse 22. Again, the saying this to Agrippa, who knows. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said. Paul didn't have a little new pocket New Testament he could take out and make reference to. Well, he just had the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Pentateuch, he had the writings of Moses, he had the prophets, uh, uh, he had the poetical works and so forth. Uh, what we call the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, that's what he had to present the gospel with. And, and uh, uh, that wasn't a big issue. It's, it's all there. Uh, Christ had to suffer, Isaiah 53. Boy, it just really lays it out very clearly in detail, the suffering of Jesus Christ on the, on the cross, Psalm 16, uh, in the same way, Psalm, Psalm 22. Uh, but even the calling to the Gentiles. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 49, verse 6 uh, says, uh, Indeed, he says, uh, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the uh, preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. It, it was always there that the gospel eventually would go to the Gentiles also. Paul's making his case here through his testimony that what I'm doing is a fulfillment of scripture. Uh, and I can reason with you from the scriptures in terms of who Jesus was, his suffering, as well as his resurrection, and my be, being called to go to the Gentiles. Well, here's kind of the response here in verse 24 to 32. Uh, we would uh, put it this way. Paul's position of a prisoner was to be more desired than that of a king. And, and Paul will make that statement. In the end, he'll say, man, uh, I wish that all of you would, could trade places with me except for these chains. King means nothing to me unless you know the Lord. That's what he's saying here. Festus is the first guy that's going to kind of go off <laughs> because uh, they... Yeah, they've listened to his little sermon, his testimony. Uh, here's, the, here's the response of these, uh, these two characters here. Verse 24. Now, as he uh, thus made his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, uh, I am not mad, most notable Festus. But speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I'm convinced that None of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was done, uh, not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with him. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So the rebuke first by, uh, by Festus. 
Well, he, he at least admits, uh, admits that Paul's a man of learning. <laughs> your, your learning is driving you, uh, driving you mad. Now, does, does Festus really think he's mad? Uh, uh, he, he's not going to send a mad guy to Nero. Uh, you know, you, you kind of hear about that. Why did you send a crazy person to me on trial? Now, he, he doesn't really believe that. Uh, you know, it's almost like he doesn't know what to say. He just wants to stop this right now. You know, he's, he's really kind of leveled all of his attention to, to Agrippa. Of course, and then anyone else that might, might be uh, uh, listening, Roman officials as well as uh, his brother Pharisees uh, over there. Uh, but uh, Festus is taking it all in, and, and he's, uh, he's, he doesn't want to hear uh, anything else. When we think about the Romans, we think about their pantheon of gods, and we think about, you know, again, we say the Romans had no culture. Basically, they stole their culture from the Greeks. Their, their culture is Greek culture. Uh, they really had no culture. They, they built great roads and buildings and had a great military. They really had no culture. Um, uh, and, they, and they accept into that culture from the Greeks and this, you know, Zeus and Apollos and uh, the, you know, the, all this mythology of uh, how, how things came about in the world and so forth. Uh, but as Charles Cochran points out in his book, Christianity and Classical Culture, uh, he points out of the fact that uh, these guys didn't really buy it. <laughs> they, you know, they would make their little pinch of incense, kind of do the, yeah, great, Apollos, do we get a day off for that? Is this Apollo day or something? You know, they, but they, they didn't really, I mean, they were, you know, these guys, pretty smart guys, and um, they didn't really buy into it. Uh, what they did buy into is me, me. Yeah, I, my, my kingdom, uh, my deal, my money, my prestige, uh, my job, my advancement, me. There's, there's, there's that religion still out there a little bit, kind of, kind of prevalent in our, our culture. But anyway, you think of the Romans, they, 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 they weren't religious in, in that sense. Uh, and as I said before, you can imagine Festus understanding who Paul was within Judaism. I don't know what he thought about Judaism, but within Judaism, he understand that Paul was somebody. Uh, and he, in a sense, he threw it all away. He threw it all away. Uh, to become a servant and a minister and preach this gospel and get beat to death uh, wherever he goes, man, you're mad. Uh, that, uh, that kind of thinking is still out there uh, in regards to, to Christians. There are Christians that call other Christians mad and fanatics. I remember as a, as a young believer and trying to share my testimony with somebody as, uh, as best as I could, and, and, and the guy called me a, a Jesus freak. I thought that was far out, you know. <laughs> of course, the lingo went with it at that time, but uh, I probably looked like it too. Uh, but uh, uh, I thought it was—I thought it was great. You know, I'd never had anybody called me that before. I thought I must be doing something right here. But uh, uh, we don't like it too much. Uh, we get insulted a lot in the media uh, today, don't don't we? In terms of uh, Christianity and so forth. Uh, but even within the church, when somebody is is so zealous for the gospel, even they are criticized from within. 1913, a man named William Borden at the age of 26, he graduated from Yale and Princeton. Uh, he uh, was the heir of uh, a great deal of money, uh, lived in Chicago in a beautiful home on Lakeshore Drive, got called to be a missionary to the Muslim world. He gave away his uh, uh, inheritance, uh, went to the mission field, half a million dollars. 1913, half a million dollars? That'd be a lot of money today. Gave it away. Didn't want a hindrance on him as he went to, uh, uh, to preach the gospel. And uh, uh, six months later, he's in a hospital in Cairo, dying of cerebral meningitis amongst uh, the heat and the flies, and dies. And, of course, there were a lot of people that said, that guy was crazy. I don't think God held that opinion, though. I don't think God holds that opinion of people that leave everything to go preach the gospel uh, to another country. <coughs> 1885, C.T. Studd comes to faith in Christ. It doesn't exactly ring a bell with this, of course, uh, but uh, uh, he was at the time considered the most famous athlete in Great Britain. So I don't know what you, who you want to compare him with today. The most famous athlete in Great Britain. And he leaves that all behind to go to China to preach the gospel. And uh, even the Christians in Great Britain thought he was crazy. Uh, the criticism, to, you know, the Festus kind of remarks are, are still out there uh, if we take uh, eternity uh, very, very seriously. There's a lot of insanity that's out there today in the West. There's millions of people that starve from one side of the world, and other people spend hundreds of dollars for a pair of Calvin Klein jeans that some uh, movie star wore on one occasion. You know, it's, it's just kind of a crazy, 
crazy world. We have an AIDS epidemic that's going on that nobody wants to talk about because it's not politically correct. Uh, and if you suggest the one thing that would completely stop it, which is chastity, you're called crazy. Is that crazy to stop people from, we, we actually know what would stop it, uh, and yet uh, uh, we don't try to try to do it. Uh, is it mad to suppose that we can find fulfillment in our possessions? I think that's kind of crazy, but people do that uh, all the time. Charles Finney, one of the great pre preachers of uh, a number of years ago who founded Oberlin College once wrote, uh, if you have much of the spirit of God, it is unlikely you'll be thought, uh, you will be thought deranged by many. <laughs> You know, if you're, if you're really like the Apostle Paul, hope to be like the Apostle Paul, uh, get ready to be criticized, sometimes from within as well as without the church. Paul's addressing Agrippa. Uh, Festus jumps in, uh, makes this, uh, this comment, and uh, Paul, you can imagine what a great debater he was. He, he doesn't even flinch. He just turns his attention back, back to uh, Agrippa again uh, and uh, says, hey, do you, you believe in the prophets? I know you do, Agrippa. He just doesn't. He just goes right, right. Hey, nice comment. Uh, I think I'm crazy. You, you have to, you know, if you're a preacher, you hate hearing that. You know, people jump and go, you're crazy. You know, that, it happens once in a while. But uh, probably have to Paul more than once. Uh, and uh, he pivots and he just goes right back to Agrippa. And he says something to him that was probably embarrassing and probably caught him off guard. Because Agrippa does believe in the prophets. At least he says he does and he studies them. Uh, and if he says, yes, I believe in the prophets, he knows where Paul's going with this. He's going to start citing the prophecies of who the Messiah is and why he had to die and where he died, how he died. He's going to go right through the list. And he doesn't really want to, doesn't really want to hear it. Uh, you know, Paul, in a sense, is saying, is, G, if, is Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah, who the prophets spoke about? Come on, Agrippa. You know, again, make the logical conclusion, uh, connect the dots. So... Uh, his uh, response is very interesting. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Uh, some of the translations, do you think that in such a short time I can, you can persuade me? Uh, and that's the idea. It's not that he's almost persuaded, but he understands where Paul's going with, with this whole thing. Uh, and it's uh, very interesting. Paul at this point, uh, lastly, reminds uh, them that he remains in the care of Christ. And that's our line in verse 29. I would to God that not only you but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Uh, Paul says, I, I would not trade my position with you uh, as a king. I would rather you change your position as king with me, except for these chains. Yet, the, you know, this all begins as Paul is the prisoner on trial. By the time it's over with, Festus and Agrippa are the ones who have been on trial and who have been tried uh, and found guilty. Uh, and they both, of course, uh, end up, as far as we know, and certainly at this juncture, uh, both reject the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. But you have to appreciate, Paul, that uh, he was excited about the opportunity and believe, and believe that uh, uh, even this wacky couple, uh, as well as this Roman ruler, might get saved. Uh, and maybe somebody else in, in that room. Uh, I just have to believe that he's... Oh, I'm just happy to, to deliver this thing to you today. Uh, and we should as well. It should be exciting to be able to uh, get, a, get a shot. You know, when somebody will crack the door open a little bit, we get to tell them our story, tell them our, uh, our testimony. Uh, it, should, it probably should just kind of make our day. Oh, hopefully it does. I know it makes my day. It's like, I don't know, whatever goes on in the day, if somewhere along the line, in the shopping center, wherever I'm at, uh, talking on the phone with somebody, if there's this little, uh, maybe it's easier, but people will just say to me, well, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's just me. How'd you get in the ministry? I, I don't know if that's like, uh, like, I can't believe you're actually a minister. I don't know sure if that's a derogatory statement they're making or like, uh, I can't believe you're a minister. But, but it opens the door. It's like, well, let me tell you how, because I wasn't always. And, and, and I, I get to tell them my story. Uh, but we all have a story to tell. Uh, if you're with somebody, uh, you got a cup of coffee in an hour, you're, you're ready to go right now. You, know, you got an hour. I mean, come on, just tell them the whole thing, all the details. Uh, but a lot of times you only get 10 minutes. A lot of times you only have five minutes. Sometimes you only have three minutes. That, that's where you have to have thought it through and figured out what you would say and, 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 and lay it out, kind of have it in the back of your mind. Uh, and it can be a great tool uh, for seeing uh, people come to faith in Christ. Uh, maybe, maybe they don't respond right then. 
But again, Paul knew the patience uh, and the perseverance required for people to come to faith in Christ. And, and God used his testimony. And I think certainly Paul would say, if God could use me, he could use anybody. Uh, none of us have that maybe phenomenal Damascus Road experience, but most of us probably didn't kill a lot of people either before we came to faith in Christ. You know, I mean, this, this, all this, this whole deal kind of goes together with his testimony. But we all have a story. Uh, and your, sto your story is meaningful to, to someone. I, I can tell you, I, I've shared my testimony before about my involvement in drugs and stuff like that. And I, I've had a response of like, <laughs> well, no wonder you're a Christian. If I was messed up like you, yeah, just try anything, man. Just, you know, give it a shot. I don't blame you. Good for you, man. Good for you. It, it wasn't too effective. You know, you have to figure out who, who you're talking to. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's going on in their, their own hearts and minds. If I'm a business guy, I talk about managing it safe way. I talk about running my own business for 20 years. Uh, those things. And how, you know, even though I was at kind of the top of my field as far as a stained glass designer, uh, I was more than happy to leave it all behind uh, in order to do what I'm doing with you today. Tell people about Jesus Christ. And that I get that. Well, I think you're nuts, you know. Yeah, but it's a, it's a great way to go. You know, but, you know, you have to, you know, where they're at, how much time do you have Pray about it. Think about it. Uh, you have a story that's meaningful to someone out there. Uh, and, and mine may be meaningless. Uh, but uh, because of your past, your experiences, the good, the bad, the difficult, uh, God can use you, wants to use you uh, in, in a powerful way. <clears throat> when we get a shot like Paul, even it's to like, Okay, I got uh, this nutcase couple in front of me that are completely immoral, but they say they believe the Bible, so I'm going for it, and and, and be happy to, happy to do it, uh, and and use what they give you, uh, and what because uh, the gospel is there. It meets their deepest needs. Everything every person is looking for: peace, hope, purpose. Everything is all found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are starving for love, and God has the ultimate love and abundant life that he wants to give them. We've experienced it. We know it. We need to let it bubble over a little more. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord.